in the last video, I was talking about how homosexuality is caused by trauma, particularly childhood trauma, trauma picked up in developmental years. And I mentioned in that video how there's no scientific evidence that anyone is born gay. I just want to quickly run through the history of this in this video to show how we got to the position that we're in today, because obviously today in the West, homosexuality is kind of being normalized to some extent. There's a much wider acceptance of it today than, say, a few decades ago. In fact, here's a graph that shows the gradual liberalization of views towards homosexuality. And many people today kind of assume that people are just born that way. So how did this happen? if there's no scientific evidence. Well, let's get into it in this video. Back in 1991, a homosexual neuroscientist called Simon LeVay set out to prove that there was such a thing as a gay brain. What he noticed was there was a part of the brain called the anterior hypothalamus, which was smaller in gay men compared to straight men. Now, this led to big sensational headlines at the time. Gay brain discovered, scientists discover gay brain, and so forth. But after the wider scientific community explored Simon LeVay's theory, the truth was revealed. All of the gay participants in LeVay's study had HIV AIDS. And HIV is known to shrink the size of the hypothalamus. In other words, a shrunken hypothalamus wasn't the cause of homosexuality. It was the result of the disease that all of the gay participants had. And indeed, there are a number of factors that cause changes to the size of the hypothalamus. Notable scientists, Ruth Hubbard and George Wald in particular, spent time on this and they completely rubbished Simon LeVay's claims, saying there was no way to tell anything about an individual's sexual orientation by looking at his hypothalamus. And indeed, 20 years later, in 2011, Simon LeVay himself had to admit that this was true. He said, it's important to stress what I didn't find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way, the most common mistake in interpreting my work, nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. To this day, science has never discovered a part of the brain that makes people gay. Now, in 1993, a gay geneticist called Dean Hamer stepped forward and he proposed the idea that there could be such a thing as a gay gene. Being a child of the 90s, I remember this. I remember people talking about the hunt for the gay gene in the 1990s. And indeed, Dean Hamer himself published a paper in Science Magazine stating that he had found it, that he had found the gay gene. He said that genetic markers on the X chromosome could be responsible for gay orientation. Now, again, this made for big headlines at the time, but again, the whole study was quickly disproved by the wider scientific community. A Canadian team ran exactly the same experiment as Dean Hamer, but on a much larger scale, and they found no evidence of gay genes. They said, it is unclear why our results are so discrepant from Hamer's original study. Because our study was larger than that of Hamer, we certainly had adequate power to detect a genetic effect as large as was reported in that study. Nonetheless, our data does not support the presence of a gene of large effect influencing sexual orientation at position XQ28 284667. They continued, these results do not support an X-linked gene underlying male homosexuality. To this day, science has never discovered a gay gene. By 2012, scientists had become exasperated trying to find gay brains and gay genes. It was fruitless. They were not coming up with any evidence. So they switched to the idea that homosexuality could perhaps be caused by epigenetics, which is the hormones that a fetus is exposed to in the womb. Now, as usual, the media jumped on this idea and it made for some sensational headlines for a few weeks or months at least. But as usual, the evidence just wasn't there for these claims. Samantha Allen, a liberal journalist writing for the Daily Beast in 2012, recognized this and she expressed her exasperation. She said, the popular media, once so easily convinced by LeVay that homosexuality resulted from brain size and by Hamer that homosexuality was genetic, promptly changed its tune to declare that homosexuality was now epigenetic. Hooray! 
If it's hard to get excited about these studies, it's because at this point, biological explanations for homosexuality are like iPhones, a new one comes out every year. In fact, Samantha Allen suggested they stop looking for scientific evidence altogether because she thought all of these failed experiments were doing more harm than good to the gay cause. All of these sensational claims that were being falsified was doing more harm than good to the gay cause. So she thought, let's just stop doing this. To this day, there is no evidence that homosexuality is caused by epigenetics either. In fact, let's ask ChatGBT about this. Has science ever discovered a gay brain? Answer in one word. It's thinking about it. No. Has science ever discovered a gay gene? Answer in one word. No. Has science ever discovered an epigenetic cause for homosexuality? Answer in one word. No. Let me ask one more question. Does science ever expect to find a genetic cause for homosexuality? Oh, what just happened there? Hit the wrong button. Answer in one word. No. Well, if there's no evidence of gay brains or gay genes or epigenetic causes, why has it become so widely accepted even among many conservatives today? Again, this graph shows how in the mid-1980s, nearly 80% of British people thought that homosexuality was wrong. But you can see how over time, the views gradually became more liberal and it gradually became more accepted. So what was causing this? If there was no scientific evidence, what was causing this gradual shift in attitudes? Well, remember that the postmodern era is marked by feelings over facts the heart over the head, the soft virtues over the hard virtues. The story of the postmodern era since 1967 has been a gradual shift towards left-wing values. And what this means is that to convince this generation, the gay lobby didn't really need to appeal to the head with facts and data and science. That's not what moves this generation. To reach this generation, all the gay lobby really needed to do was tug at the heartstrings to make emotional appeals. And that's exactly how it happened. People were emotionally manipulated into accepting homosexuality. The gay lobby started inserting gay characters into movies and into TV shows, always with a sympathetic angle. The gay character would always be portrayed as the kind one or the happy one or the funny one. And the message was kind of Oh, look, they just want someone to love. How can that be wrong? And look how nice they are. Look how funny they are. And look how sad they are that people are disapproving of their homosexuality. Of course, the people who opposed the homosexuality in these shows were always portrayed as evil and mean. They were bigots and fascists and Nazis. And the message was, you don't want to be one of those evil, mean people, do you? You don't want to be a Nazi, do you? Because that's what you'll be if you oppose homosexuality. So by continually presenting homosexuality in a positive light in the media and in ways designed to pull at the heartstrings, the gay lobby managed to move the needle on this. And then you had celebrities jumping on board and the social contagion, the peer pressure, the desire to conform to the herd. People would soften their stance because they would know someone who was gay and they just wanted to be nice to that person. And gradually, people just stopped speaking up to question it. Even though it's what they felt, they still had misgivings about it. They stopped speaking up about it. Because if you did, the liberals would come at you with their pitchforks and their torches and demand cancellation. And you could lose your job, your income, your friends, your family. And this is how a whole generation was emotionally manipulated into accepting it in spite of there being no scientific evidence that it's innate. Which is why, again, 
Even some conservatives today don't speak up about this. The fact remains though that despite decades of searching for a scientific cause, none has yet been found. What we do know though, and this is what we were talking about in the previous video, is that there is huge amounts of accumulating evidence that all sexual perversions are rooted in trauma. And so I repeat what I said in the previous video. If we really want to be loving, homosexuality is not to be affirmed, but rather it is to be healed because homosexuality is brokenness.